Uh, yes, well, thank you. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Uh, I said, uh, I come from another display tradition, so you'll get no slides from me. Um, we do not, uh, historians rely a lot more on arguments uh, than on theory and proof, and far more on verbal than, than visual. So, uh, so be it. Uh, we'll give you some idea of what I do and what kind of data is out there uh, in the historical record to deal with this. Now, I work primarily in what referred to as borderlands. Long story there why it's called that. But uh, those areas on the edges of European expansion in the uh, 17th to 19th centuries. I work primarily in the U.S. Southwest, northern Mexico, but also interested in uh, uh, South America, South Africa, um, uh, uh, the Caucasus, Australia. There's, there's a number of places where, where these types of situations come together. And one of the enduring conditions of a borderland is that they are typically violent places, far more than more centrally located areas. And so my historical efforts are basically spent on trying to understand why these are more violent places. And actually what I probably stumbled into was dealing with the problem of the collective action. I kind of realized that's really where my questions began. Why would this area be more, more violent than elsewhere? And what I basically ended up doing was reading a lot of evolutionary theory, uh, read a lot of many works by pe individuals in this room, and came to basically an argument of what I call usable violence, that people, communities, individuals can use violence, can risk killing or being killed or suffering the effects of violence in order to do things. And we'll leave it uh, with that uh, uh, right there. Or I can borrow from Kim and, and stuff. Um, so what I want to do is give you, discuss really three projects. And when a historian says project, we mean book. So three projects, one's completed, two are ongoing. The first one is uh, I looked at uh, Chiricahua Apaches in a place called Hanos in north, northwestern Chihuahua. It's still there. I understand it's, it's a very sleepy little town still. Uh, three speed bumps, three topes, and a dog uh, was what I was described by a friend of mine from Chihuahua. Uh, Chiricahua Apaches, of course, are uh, mostly our Geronimo's people. Uh, and ultimately are people at the Paskin who migrated into the U.S. Southwest, that part of the world, uh, about 1500, uh, common era, to get us back to <laughs> that all dates will be in that, around that time. Hanos Presidio is, uh, a, Presidio is a garrison community. Uh, uh, it actually also means jail in Spanish, so the two get confused sometimes. Uh, it was uh, locally recruited, uh, sustained. It was there, formed in the mid-1680s. The original recruits were, in fact, refugees from the Pueblo Revolt in New Mexico of 1680. They never went home back to New Mexico. Uh, and it remained there until basically the garrison quit in 1858, internal rebellion in, in Mexico, but uh, the community remained there for that time. So for two centuries, 1680s to 1880s, these two communities basically existed in violence and, and cooperation. They, you, you see raids, you see exchanges, you see both. And so what I, looking at this, trying to understand, as the argument in the book was, look, they were doing things with this. They used violence to build their communities. They used violence... Uh, to follow the, their life paths, especially for men to make their way to adulthood. They use violence to maintain their households, and ultimately they use, attempted to use violence to maintain their security, and it would this that would drive them down into uh, what we really recognize as the later Apache Wars. Okay, so the first thing, to build their communities. What we do know is this. Um, both sides, both the Hanos, Hanos and Chiricahua, incorporated the original udo Aztecan speaking peoples in the region. Uh, we have uh, there's some good DNA evidence that a lot of the mothers amongst the uh, Chiricahua Apaches come, came from outside the community. Uh, and there's also just the stories. There's, um, there was a guy named um, El Tobobo, who was an Udo Aztecan, a Suma Indian. He, there had been a revolt in the 1680s. A bunch of these people had taken off into the hills. Uh, they uh, set out a raiding party, a, sp a Spanish campaign, this is how we know this, cut the trail, realized something was going on, followed them down, tracked them down, attacked them, killed most of the men and then went off to deal with the revolt of the Seri and, and Sonora. So what was left to do? Well, this community picked up under El Tobobo, and they moved up, and they joined uh, the Apaches, who were coming into the area. And the Apaches said, no problem. We need wives. You have wives. We'll take care of you. Um, and again, uh, uh, Apache matrilocal uh, patterns may help explain some of this. You had to go live with your wife's family and her mother-in-law. There's some wonderful coyote tales of sexual encounters with one mother's-in-law. It was assumed that you would be attracted to your mother-in-law, so you had to stay away. Uh, so maybe a wife without a mother-in-law would have been very attractive. Um, we also know that they, um, 
then raided each other. They went and took each other's captives back and forth. Uh, I think it's in the 1740s. A Apache woman is captured. She's baptized as Maria, a servant of the Presidio captain. Uh, he, uh, she then marries about a year later to his um, uh, mulatto esclavo servant, his, his mulatto slave. Uh, they have a child who's baptized into the community, uh, and then Marie ultimately dies, and that child, she goes on and becomes part of the community. I think she ends up marrying a soldier who then claimed on one of his, when one of his children was born to be, to be Espanol, to be white, even though the priest kind of said, I think he's mestizo. So we see these incorporations going on throughout. And again, it was involving campaigns, and indeed there you see time and time again people taking prisoners. Uh, PA, they were referred to as piezas, the, uh, the bag of the hunt, uh, kind of roundabout language. Uh, they also, violence becomes a critical way, warfare becomes a rogue way to become a man. Uh, Apaches, it's quite interesting, they were, you had to be an apprentice, go on four raids uh, and just watch. And it's the usual harassment older men seem to enjoy making younger men do. And I say this as someone who's had to go through Oster Candidate School. Um, uh, you had to wear a special funny hat. Um, you couldn't scratch yourself with your hand. You had to use a stick. You had to use a very indirect language. A horse became known as someone who sticks his nose in the ground, that sort of thing. But after you did that, you were eligible to marry. You, could, you were a man. You could go out and, and go do things. But how to find wives, though? Because women are the one thing that... that, that uh, one valuable, unquestionably valuable thing in Cherokee family. You bring the man in from the outside, so you've got to be really careful with your daughters. Well, again, back through this warfare, to mobilize more than one community, they would do around what was called fierce dancing, and in which there would be this, uh, they would bring everyone together, they would call men in to participate, go off on the raid, come back, but after the raid, they would repeat this dance, but then there would be social dancing, and that's when men and women would meet, and you had to have gone on the raid to participate in this dancing. So with that as well, uh, they use violence to maintain their households. Uh, basically, the, um, the, uh, you look at enlistment papers. As men were promoted up and gained more money, more access to the supply system, you see them being very carefully recording all of their information. And what we typically see is there would be, okay, you have an open slot here in your company. Give us three names. The most senior name would be first in all, except in one case. I found out about 70, that guy was selected. The one case, the other guy wasn't, um, they needed someone to be literate, and the other, only one guy was in that whole thing. So it's very clear they were able to use uh, uh, both of those as well. But they also wanted to maintain a reputation as someone who would use violence to maintain their households. They were often gone, especially the soldiers. Uh, one case, a soldier was sent out to guard the horse herd. Presidio had a horse herd of over 1,000 horses. Um, he deserts. He rides the 300 miles to, uh, the, to, his, to the uh, commandant general goes in and says, hey, I've deserted, explains why. Well, the, the commander had locked his wife up while he was gone. And he didn't appreciate that, and he goes back with a letter from the commandant general to the captain saying, don't mess with the men's wives. Leave them alone. This is to the perdition of the honor of good soldiers. Uh, Apaches had the habit of applying the word huskier in front of their names as someone who was a, definitely a senior warrior. Again, someone not to be messed with. Marriages among the Chiricahua were economic. Once a woman married, she was now far freer than she'd ever been as a child, uh, as a young woman, and there were all sorts of, again, you see stories about all sorts of hanky-panky going on uh, around that. And so being a, a big dude was, was a way to prevent that. And then they finally, they attempted to use violence to uh, secure themselves. By the 1830s, 1840s, this leads you into a, a cycle of revenge and retaliation. Of course, Anglos show up after the mid-1840s. Uh, and find this back and forth warfare going on. And they get in the, what is it, the classic inter, uh, international relations thing of a security dilemma. Anything I do to protect myself indirectly threatens the other side, so the other side then responds, and I then have to respond, so it, it just ramps its way up until finally a, a denouement in the 1880s. What's fascinating about this is that by the end there, uh, all this warfare was essentially uh, decentralized uh, uh, on the Mexican side. It was militia forces, volunteer forces, who got nothing more than the loot they took on a raid uh, to, to participate. And the fact that Geronimo was the last one out, the last one captured, a man who was not a leader, not a war leader, but rather an advisor, uh, speaks volumes to the fact that Apache political control was dropping as well. Okay, second project working along that way is actually trying to look at the warfare that took the war between Navajos and New Mexicans. About seven decades of warfare that went on there. And this I borrowed into looking at um, pastoralism. 
by 1800, both communities, the Navajos are Diné, and the uh, New Mexicans are Nueva Mexicanos, they called themselves, and I'm lumping both the, the Hispanic and Pueblo Indian population together, were all in for sheep pastoralism. It was the keystone of Navajo survival, it was the cornerstone of Mexican economy. But if you have, you go pastoralist, it seems to be some demands come upon you. You need land, you need labor, you need livestock. Land is interesting. Um, I can date to when the war starts. It's due to a land grant at a place called Cebolleta out on, the, it was great, I know a number of you have been in Albuquerque, so no Mount Taylor, uh, a place called Cebolleta that only four years prior had been identified by the Spanish uh, commander in the north as belonging to the Navajo. So two people, one piece of land, never a good, um, never a good, uh, a good scenario. And indeed, you need, the, they both needed land even though they grazed differently as this is, they would wear out the graves relatively quickly, and they needed it. But what interesting, it happens in about a generation, the struggle for land stalemates, and, but both sides begin to expand. Navajo continue over the, to the west, get amongst the Hopi. They go north to the San Juan River. Uh, New Mexicans go east onto the plains. They begin to work their way north. So both sides end up looking for land elsewhere. But they also warred for labor. The base of production unit is the family. There's only, to, to, to add more workers requires time, requires investment. And so a good shortcut seems to have been uh, taking slaves from each other. Uh, you needed shepherds for larger herds. You needed weavers for the uh, very important blanket. The Navajo blanket becomes a very crucial piece of, uh, of, uh, of trading equipment on the, um, on the Santa Fe Trail as that trade gets going. And so raiding for captives becomes a very common promise. Uh, uh, practice. It seems to have been amongst New Mexicans uh, a common for a rich family, a big sheep owning family. The dowry for the daughter would be a Navajo girl taken captive and given to her to raise as a servant. Worth $500, that's 500 to 1,000 sheep depending on prices. Two to 300 is probably a viable flock. So you do this once or twice, you're set. It's probably worth it. Uh, on the Navajo side, the bigger outfits uh, called Rico, but rich, but that's not really a good definition. It appears that in those, the family's herds belong to the head mother, but if the head man wanted to get his own herds and his own flocks of horses, the head mother's basically said, fine, you get the people to herd them. Our kids are going to go watch, and our, my relatives are going to go watch our herds, so they would also trade for captives. How many? Boy, I wish I knew. Maybe 10% of households at any time held at least one, between one to five servants, but enough that it continually went on on both sides across those seven decades. And finally, they warred for livestock. Sheep are stupid. They will try to kill themselves. Most livestock is, actually. It's one of those di dirty secrets of ranching. Uh, and so anything you traded, a bad winter snap, you need more sheep. Uh, anything you sold, if you're New Mexican down to New Mexico, you needed more sheep. Um, uh, the Utes discovered that American traders would trade them good stuff for sheepskin. So they raided sheep, and the Navajos needed more sheep. There are unquestionably sheep that were born in one place and crossed back and forth in several times. Tens of thousands of, hundreds of thousands of sheep went back and forth. So both sides continually raided for, uh, for, for livestock. What's, what's very interesting in this is that both basically were um, uh, decentralized warfare. And there was no central control. Amongst New Mexicans, they had to rely upon the militia. Once you told a guy in a village, hey, you're the local militia sergeant, you have the authority and the ability to do this, they would often raise their own parties and off they go and raid. Um, sometimes they raided New Mexicans. There was one case they got caught. <laughs> they went out and rode out, came back with 2,000 sheep and said, yeah, we found these sheep being driven off by the Navajo. And the local official went, those are mine. And they had just taken them from his flock. There's, that clearly went on more than that. What's fascinating about this is that we know, actually, there seems to be the, 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 the Navajo had a word for them, it seems. They took the word for Mexican, Nakai, or Spaniard, and they called them Nakajeses, which is an interesting combination of, of, of Diné and Spanish. Basically, dirty, thieving little Mexicans is probably the best way to translate it. Uh, on the Navajo side, it's completely decentralized. The war leaders, Reshinaque, um, were anyone who knew the way, the singer knew a, a way of going to war, bear way, frog way, enemy way. There was a number of ways, very ceremonial ways. Not under the authority of the headman. Headman had some... Um, could, could sway him, but couldn't tell him what to do. And so they would, off, they would go off completely on their own. And New Mexicans just referred to these as ladrones, as thieves. 
So both sides knew, realized a lot of the violence was being done by other guys outside the community, but were never able to pull it under control. So the last project working on that's just getting started is, trying to, is looking at um, the lower Rio Grande border between Texas and, and Mexico, looking at how theft, land, labor, livestock, notice a trend, uh, sovereignty uh, le led to uh, the violence that went on there. And actually, a current paper that will be next week in Mexico City is um, looking at how come theft of livestock jumped up after 1866 was accompanied by a jump in violence. And what appears is that, well, the livestock was very valuable at this time. This is a time when the great cattle drives are going on, uh, a time when industrialization is happening, so hides are becoming very valuable. But it's also very vulnerable. This is open stock ranching. You just put it out there, you round it up once a year, and hope what you still have is there before. So it's, it's quite vulnerable. But the ranchers knew this. The ranchers knew that their livestock was quite vulnerable to anyone. They had to maintain a reputation as someone who was not to be messed with. But with the border in between the two places, any time there was livestock being driven back across, uh, they, they, they knew they would lose it. So their chance when they encountered someone they thought they was a thief, or they thought might be a thief, was to hang them, shoot them, what have you. Well, and they used to say the guys out raiding livestock didn't want to kill, but they knew if they didn't kill, they would be killed. So they started killing. And you begin to see this thing spiral out of control. It becomes a national level problem to the extent the U.S. Army is authorized hot pursuit across the border into Mexico, and the Mexicans get in the way, shoot at them. Basically authorizing the United States to go to war over this situation. So, Okay, so these projects to this bigger issue of decentralized warfare. Well, I think, and I don't think anyone's going to argue in this, in this crowd, but it's, it's very clear that in, in the historical record, it's very clear, we can find evidence that individuals and communities are very willing to participate in violence, participate in warfare, if, albeit often uh, on their own conditions, uh, absent any sort of coercion if they're pursuing their own goals. And also there's one other point that, to make on this, in that once these decentralized wars get going, it takes large amounts of state power, often brutally applied, and long, and long periods of time in terms of the decades to bring it under control. In the case of the Chiricahua, when the last Chir Geronimo surrendered for the last time, he did it several times, they took every Chiricahua Apache, including the scouts that hunted him down, sent him off to Florida, exiled him to Florida. Men and women, two camps, different coasts. Then allowed him to go back to uh, um, Alabama, then allowed him to go to uh, uh, Oklahoma, and a few went back to the Mescalero Reservation in eastern New Mexico, never been allowed back to their home territory. That, that, that brutal of an existence. Amongst the Navajo, of course, the United States comes in, is able to take advantage of the Civil War. Lots of uh, weapons, they raise a whole bunch of New Mexicans. Kit Carson takes them out with the help of a bunch of Utes and Pueblo uh, militias, and they round up the Navajo and send them off to Bosque Redondo, a very brutal incarcerment, though they would return from that in 1868, but a brutal experience nonetheless. And of course, in the case of the Texas-Mexican borderlands, it would be in the 19-teens during the Mexican Revolution that you would basically fundamentally have what would count to almost to an ethnic cleansing of, of, uh, of Hispanics along the border in response to uh, violence of the Mexican Revolution. So um, with that happy thought, I will end. Do we have any, any questions? Let me, um, let me ask if you can maybe just describe a little bit about the actual pattern of conflict or raids, what they were like. Uh, off the, uh, we'll go off the Chiricahua side, uh, a raid for pure economic reasons, a woman would often point out the fact. And if you didn't want to go, that was a sign more of laziness, not of any sort of lack of manhood. Six to, six to ten usually move, would go on foot. Uh, move in, find a location, not trying to kill, don't want to be killed, sneak up, again, livestock's very vulnerable, or lay along a road and kill someone and then, and then escape. When you go to the Mexican side or Spanish side, uh, you would see, depending upon the year, is in the Spanish period, larger campaigns, several hundred guys, everyone has two or three horses. Horses wear out really, really easily, and you need to swap them at midday, even today. My cowboy father rides three, half in the morning, one in the morning, one in the afternoon wrestling. Um, they would go in and then basically try to, they would hide the horse herd because it would kick up huge dust clouds that could be seen. They would hide the horse herd, move at night, and then attempt to fall uh, unsuspectingly. 
The greatest example of this was a, a guy by the name of Juan Batista de Anza, who was the uh, governor of New Mexico. He was going to go attack the Comanche. So he rode up the San Luis Valley at night. So as the, the Comanche uh, party is up on La Veda Pass in that area, could not see him coming. So it was, uh, they were um, uh, both focused on, both sides had to focus a lot on being as stealthy as possible. And upon uh, uh, trying to get surprised and attacking, and they usually did get surprised. Because once they knew they were coming, they would, they would scatter and flee. transition to warfare being the entire way of life. Mm -hmm. um, as a hunter-gatherer specialist, the okay. hunter-gatherer mythology about the Chiricahua is that at some point they transitioned from being foragers to being professional uh, raiders and that in fact they didn't have a subsistence economy. All they did was live mm -hmm. off of raiding. Um, is that true? And how, how often do we have cases of transition in other places oh, in the good. world to population where the entire population right. is living off nothing but raiding. That's the way they make a right. living. There's, my sh I do not think there is a, there's good evidence that, that there was continual agriculture. Spanish campaigns often report trampling uh, cornfields, going to a Chiricahua camp, attacking it, not finding one there and trampling the cornfields. So they were still planting. I think they were still planting. I don't think they ever went just to raiding. What appears, and it's a single, it's a single source, but um, the, the Chiricahua, or people who would become known as the Chiricahua, during the 17th century got involved in the horse trade. The Plains Apaches were being, um, were basically trying to drive off the, uh, the non-Plains Apaches, whatever they were, we're not really sure who they were. They needed horses to do this. The Chiricahua had become the middlemen getting horses out of New Mexico, trading them overwards. And when New Mexicans all left at the Pueblo Revolt, it appears some of them continued to follow them down and continue the horse raiding. And that seems to have been, but that was, that was part of a trading pattern, not just a pure raiding pattern. So I, I, I don't, yeah, I don't have any, I don't know of any evidence that suggests that they were ever just completely raiding. They traded all, in fact, quite often. Hanos became famous for the fact that Apaches would raid up in the United States or raid in the neighboring state and come back to Hanos and trade their goods. So they, they just weren't, yeah, there's, I don't, th it's, I don't think there was ever a transition to nothing but raiding. By the end, people like Geronimo's people, yes, you're being chased, hunted, through, yes, but that's the very end. 